Many of us are feeling the weight of transitioning to a new school year, which even in the best of times can be stressful. Um, and this year is certainly like no other. As a working mother myself, I too am feeling the heightened anxiety of the unknown and concern of how we are all gonna fare in this new environment. And that's why I'm excited about our guests today. They're gonna be sharing expertise about the social and emotional learning of us, the adults. The heightened demands on educators and parents makes caring for ourselves more important than ever. They'll be talking about how we can attend to our own SEL and well being so that we can be healthy and present for the young people in our lives. We're also going to talk about the context and environments that we're in and what we all need to do to get through this in the most effective and humane way possible. We hope that you find this conversation to be a reminder of the strengths that are within you and that you leave with some strategies for how to continue to build upon those strengths. To get us started, I'm pleased to turn it over to our moderator, Castle's own Dr. Deidre Farm. Today we will be focusing on the importance of adult SEL in these unprecedented times. One thing that has been very apparent from the collaborating districts working with Castle is they all say, oh, we wish we had started with the adults. And that is during, quote, normal times. Imagine, as Melissa stated, the additional burdens and stressors that adults have now as they try to navigate life in their own homes, as they are also trying to be the teacher and having the pressure at all times of the impact of COVID-19. This indeed necessitates an additional focus on adult SEL. We know that adults are the torchbearers for the culture and climate that will be ignited in a school, and they are also the torchbearers for the relationships that will be formed between their colleagues and between students, whether in presence or virtual as we are during this time. We will be looking at the research around adult SEL, some practical applications about what does it mean, particularly during this time. And we have the additional benefit of thinking about SEL through the lens of indigenous cultures. What does it mean to go even deeper with, the, with those kinds of groundings that we find in, in, in indigenous cultures? To get us started, I'm happy to invite Dr. Kimberly Schonert Reichel to join me on screen at this time. Hi, dear Welcome, John. Kim. Welcome to you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Dr. Kimberly Schonert Reichel is a professor and applied development psychologist in the Human Development Learning and Cultural Program at the University of British Columbia. Kim is also a CASEL board member. So she's wearing many hats. She's a researcher whose study of SEL and well being for students ta has taken place in schools and in districts in real time, working with both students and teachers. So the perspectives that she brings are very much research based, but grounded in the reality of context. So again, it's my pleasure to welcome you, Kim. And I do have a question to set us off, and that is, how do you define adult SEL? And I believe you have a slide to help inform us. Yes, I do. Um, so this is such an important question, you know, and as a former teacher who taught both middle school and an, in an alternative high school, I know how important teacher well-being is, because I recall the days in which uh, my own stress really uh, was so important for my students' well-being. I would just transfer over, and I'll talk more about that. But what I have in this infographic is really about the essential ingredients of school-wide SEL. And I really put forth the argument, as does CASEL, systemic SEL has to include several things. It's not just about promoting the SEL of students, but it also includes creating the learning contexts that are equitable, safe, supportive, participatory, that involve parents and, gu and guardians, as well as other community members. And part of that to happen is a focus on the adults, a 
focused on promoting the adult SEL. So I, I really uh, believe it's so critical to when you ever think of SEL, you don't just think of the students, you have to think of all three of these dimensions. Now, when we talk about adult SEL, it includes those same dimensions of student SEL, developing self-awareness of your own emotions, implicit biases, um, your own strengths and weaknesses, your social awareness, your empathy, your ability to uh, see, take others' perspectives, colleagues, parents, the students, as well as uh, responsible decision-making, uh, making ethical choices, creating a collective uh, environment where you really think about collective efficacy, as well as relationship skills, and then self-management, being able to manage your stress and have tools and strategies to really um, be able to figure that um, what are the best ways in which to promote your own well-being and that self-care? Um, and now, and 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 I would say that more than any other time that I've witnessed is the importance of focusing on the adults SEL because we know how critical that is for promoting the well-being of not only yourself but also of your students. Thank you. And I heard you talk talk about safe and participatory learning environments. And later on, we're going to talk about, so how does that transfer from an in-person context to a virtual context? How do you still make sure the learning environment is safe and participatory? So those are some things that we will be getting into later on. So given the scope of adult SEL, as you just described, to what extent is it covered in educator preparation programs? And if it's not, is you know, is there light on the horizon? You know, it's so interesting because, um, you know, having gone through a teacher education program actually at Illinois State University, I don't know if there's any other colleagues on the on this webinar that have gone to Illinois State. It was a really great program, but nowhere in that uh, training did I receive any information about both social and emotional learning. Uh, and uh, as well as uh, adult SEL, promoting your own SEL. And that was years ago. But what's so surprising is even currently, very little is being done to focus on preparing teachers to promote the students' social and emotional learning, as well as their own um, SEL. What, what's interesting too, you know, when we talked about the context is um, when we did a review, we did a scan, it's actually on the CASEL website, to reach the students, teach the teachers, um, if anyone wants to look at that, where we looked at 4,000 courses across all states and teachers' uh, education programs and colleges of education. We found so little being done, but around the classroom aspect, most of the courses were on classroom management and were really more about how to respond to misbehavior in students. Very little on proactive approaches to create cultivating that supportive classroom environment. So there's things happening now at University of British Columbia where I am. For 10 years, we've had an SEL um, cohort in our teacher preparation program. And there's other places happening as well. University of Colorado Boulder now has a certificate program in SEL for teachers um, and other initiatives I know in Connecticut are developing um, as well as uh, California and in um, Oregon. So it's emerging now, but still there's much to be done. Well, it's really exciting to hear that there are pockets throughout the country that are really beginning to highlight the importance of preparing prospective educators for this very proactive approach to classroom management. Uh, we all know that when you have a solid relationship, the uh, number of incidents of misbehavior tend to go down. So I'm really happy to hear that. The other thing that I, I really wanted to highlight is the fact that so many of our collaborating partner districts are spending a lot of time in really helping to make sure that SEL is part of their new teacher induction programs, uh, since they are aware that this is something that still is not universal as part of the core instruction in terms of preparing educators to come into our context. So thank you for that hopeful uh, overview of what might be coming. At this point, I'd like to invite uh, Chas Desjardins to join us. Welcome, Chas. Um, Chas. In her professional role, Chas is the district principal 
of Indigenous Education for the Vancouver School Board. But what I would really like to do is to give Chaz an opportunity to introduce herself as well. Nancy, good morning. My name is Chaz Desjardins. My traditional name is Kamanisiu Kamawa Pisuwat, which translates from Nihio Wiwin, which you recognize as Cree, into English as Helper of the Thunderbirds. I am a um, member to the Cold Lake First Nations. I'm a Treaty 6 ISKU, and I am the daughter of Robert Edmund Desjardins, who is a Nihio Metis. Uh, um, he's passed on, um, and I am the daughter of uh, Diane Lorraine Johnson, whose um, ancestry is English, French, and Spanish. So I really um, honor and uphold my Indigenous um, ancestry and also recognize um, my mother's ancestry. Um, thank you for having me this morning. I'm really excited. It's such an honor to uh, be a part of this panel to, to share my perspective as um, in regards to SEL and just holistic uh, well-being and in general for my own understanding as a Nihio Métis woman. Thank you, Chaz. Thank you for that beautiful extended introduction. I couldn't wait to get over the professional introduction, which is important, but equally important is your acknowledgement and affirmation of all of the identities that go into helping make you who you are. So this is a powerful way of really adults connecting with themselves more deeply to create a, a more holistic sense of how they're going to connect with their students. So what have been your various roles in Vancouver and how has viewing your responsibilities through an indigenous lens given you an additional perspective on the work? Well, I've been in education now for 21 years and was mainly a classroom teacher for 14 years, teaching high school, uh, fine arts, theater and drama and social studies. But I've always been a strong advocate uh, for supporting all students, in particular indigenous students. My perspective, I always come from who I am and, and where I come from. So my people come from the prairies where we're plains people. So uh, I center all my understandings and my lived experience in, you know, the history of my Nahio Wiwin, uh, Nahio Metis uh, being, but do acknowledge that, you know, I, I come from a, a mixed background, but I'm also member to the Cold Lake First Nations. And, and so, when I think about my experience in the classroom and now as an administrator with the Vancouver School Board, a principal, uh, there's some really kind of grounding philosophies, you know, that kind of guide my work and how I go about doing my work. And I never, you know, I'm always having to be reminded about where I come from and who I am in my work, because that's really integral to how I go about my work, leading and also supporting um, Indigenous uh, youth. Um, I have to be an advocate for them, but I'm an advocate for all learners at the Vancouver School Board because I think everybody can benefit from Indigenous uh, worldviews and the diversity of that and that experience. So we've seen some great um, um, growth uh, within the Vancouver School Board and uh, a lot of successes. So I just, and I will speak to some of those philosophies when we uh, get into more of the questions that you're going to share and ask us. Thank you. Thank you. So just for clarification for our viewers who may not quite be familiar with the term indigenous or indigenous lens, um, what would be a basic definition for them? And also, what would be the work of adults who want to adopt such a stance? <laughs> Well, Indigenous, you know, it's just kind of an umbrella term to, it's a collective term um, that has been largely used in the last, in scholarly work, uh, from my understanding, uh, in the last, you know, 10 years. But as Indigenous peoples, we always, when we position ourselves and introduce ourselves, we're always introducing ourselves from, from the lands that we come from. So I introduce myself as a uh, Cree Métis woman and Nihil Métis woman, so that connects me to a particular place. And so, first and foremost, it's most respectful um, to have others ask us, "Where are you from?" Because um, we may be Indigenous, but we come; our histories are connected to uh, a certain place. Um, so, 
sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. I could get so excited about sharing. Um, I, I think about, you know, when you talk about the philosophy, I think the lens that I, and I've always encouraged educators, um, my work is grounded in the four R's of Indigenous philosophy and actually now they're nine R's and I'll speak to like the uh, five R's, but the four R's in particular are um, respect, relevancy, reciprocity and responsibility. And I think that is a lens that non-Indigenous peoples can uh, use when they think about, you know, social emotional learning and if they want to go deeper into understanding um, Indigenous uh, holistic well-being that is a lens through which non-Indigenous educators and adults can can look at. Now I'll explain when we talk about um, respect, it's a respect for all beings, um, everyone. And for us as Indigenous people, we respect that, you know, we have a vast uh, relationship to others, but also we have a relationship to the spirit world, to our, our animal, uh, the animals, uh, the plants. Relevance is being relevant in our work every day and being, you know, the best version of yourself when you come to work every day. That's how I see it. Reciprocity is is about giving back, always giving back. We have a responsibility when we come into this world as um, when I come into this world, the Creator brought me here for a purpose. So I have to self-actualize that purpose. And with that, I have a responsibility to share my gifts. And lastly, res res responsibility is about, you know, I have a responsibility to myself and to others. Thank, Thank you. you. And I know that later on, we, we do have a slide that we'll be showing that has the R's, uh, R framework on it, and it will be available. So it sounds like to adopt this perspective, there really is a lot of deep introspection that is needed on the part of the adults. So you really do get in touch with not only who you are, your lineage, um, your history, your, your struggles and your triumphs, but that then enables you to relate on a deeper, more meaningful level with others. Mm -hmm. The question that I have is, is this pretty much the perspective that is woven into schools in throughout British Columbia? Uh, I think people are coming uh, to understand more about Indigenous uh, worldviews and philosophies and, and pedagogies. And with that, um, I think it is becoming um, more widely understood. Um, the newly revised uh, BC curriculum has only been in place for about two to three years. And, and we're really at the beginning of to understand um, Indigenous uh, worldviews, which are diverse um, and um, across, you know, Turtle Island, uh, it, it, that's how you want to. There are many, many nations with different perspectives. So I think, you know, lots of people are learning um, just about the, the beauty of the perspective. And how, if you begin to um, situate yourself and who, and begin to learn more about who you are and where you come from, that we all come from uh, amazing histories, and that we all need to think about, you know, how those histories have, you know, um, really kind of shaped how who we are, right? And so, a lot of non-Indigenous people are beginning to do that work. But it Thank you. So the self, I'm sorry, the self-awareness piece of it is where we really begin this, mm -hmm. this journey. Thank you so much. I'd like to take a few minutes now to get a little deeper into the actual research around adult SEL. So Kim, if you could tell us more about the, um, the scholarly research, and then Chaz, I'm going to ask you to expand our concept about research by helping us think more about other types of research that might not be documented, that might not be called, quote, scholarly research, but is definitely as valid. So Kim, let's begin with you. Right, well, there's a few things I, I just wanna sort of circle back to what we know, are teachers stressed? Like, do we need to, or are educators stressed? Or why do we need to think about the adults? You know, and there is some research showing, for example, a Gallup poll a couple of years ago find that 46% of teachers reported high levels of stress um, on par with nurses and even above doctors. And that we know that between 23 to 40% of teachers leave the profession in the first five years of teaching. And many of them say the reason they leave is not because they couldn't teach math or 
reading. It was because of uh, problems with student discipline, not knowing what to do and high levels of stress. Um, and just a, a kind of factoid is that uh, every year, as the amount of teachers who leave the profession, it costs the US $7 billion in the cost of retraining and trying to do that. So uh, uh, really focusing on, on educator or adult SEL is, is critical for so many reasons. The other one is we know that stress is contagious. You know, so some people might say, yeah, teachers are stressed. Why does that matter? Well, um, we know that that stress can be circled, you know, go down or trickle down into the classroom. Some research we did here in actually Vancouver, uh, school district in fourth to seventh grade classrooms, is we asked teachers to report on their levels of stress and burnout. And so they did surveys. And then for the students to uh, look at their stress, we wanted to kind of get under the skin. So we collected their cortisol, which is a hormone that gives you your level of stress it's a healthy pattern is sort of peaks about a half an hour of awakening and then decreases the rest of the day um and and just to get cortisol just if people are wondering you get actually collect saliva and you're able to look at the stress hormone in that saliva um and just as another thing part of the study the kids loved giving us their spit so if anybody knows fourth to seventh grade students they love participating in the research and love to give us their saliva um but what was fascinating is is that when we looked at the relationships between teachers levels of stress and burnout as they reported and kids saliva we found an interesting um result we found that those classrooms in which the teachers reported the highest levels of stress and burnout those students had the highest levels of cortisol indicative of stress. Now we don't know which direction it came from where the students coming in with more stress and vulnerability and teachers were catching that because they're high empathy or the teachers stressed and were passing it on to the students or was it some combination? But what it means really, it underlines the importance. If you're going to be focusing on promoting the well-being of students, you have to start with the adults. You need to really focus on that well-being. And what we also know is that adults uh, with higher, uh, educators with higher levels of SEL actually are more effective in implementing SEL programs. There's also research shows they're better at, have stronger positive student-teacher relationships, are able to create those caring environments. And even some recent research is now showing that adults, uh, teachers or educators, when they implement SEL programs, that they that actually it could improve their own um, well-being. So there's a couple of studies now showing that there's um, an effect the other way. So we know how important these um, this factor of adult SEL is for student well-being, and there's now a number of studies. So, um, and and I think the last thing um, that I want to say is there's now research really showing, and I'll get to this later, that you actually can um, promote adult well-being, the te the educator well-being. There are now programs and practices that are evidence-based that really show that you can help reduce teacher stress, um, and that will have an effect on on students. So we can do something about it. I want to remain optimistic. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you for that rich uh, overview of the research, the type of research that usually comes from university studies. But I also want to talk a little bit about, um, in, in the name of equity of perspectives, you know, what research do we have that might not be, you know, university backed, but the story? So, um, Chaz, what are the kinds of research? How do other perspectives rise to the surface as being really valid ways of understanding the complexity? Well, I think, you know, um, Kim talked about relationships and the relationships are, are crucial for social emotional learning. Those relationships that are, are really, um, foundational and it and they're foundational for any groups of uh, of people um, in particular indigenous uh, people are they that's one of the the five r's is relationships and i i when you're in the classroom as an educator in front of your your class as uh, as a teacher or whether you're an administrator or whether you're a parent it's like developing those relationships that is really kind of the foundation in which you need to create that kind of sense of um, safety um, in your classroom. That is so integral. But I do respect the fact now with COVID-19, the stress 
that educators are taking on. Everyone's taking on stress. You know, Kim talked earlier about, you know, and I've I've felt it. I'm, you know, uh, an administrator. Have two young daughters. One's in grade three. One's in grade nine. You know, my husband has taken on the education of the the grade three student, or my youngest, who's Kaylin, and my become the teacher. And because you know, a lot of the the work in the last few months has been online. But you know, the, our kids still need that support. So it is about relationships, I think is key and foundational to that work. And it's about, it's reciprocal. So when you talk about that connection and the impact and how you are presenting yourself in the classroom and how you how do you go about doing your work and even let the interconnection between, you know, you being as an educator in a classroom and, and then the broader collective, right? How healthy is that collective? Because you have to realize that your energies are interconnected to everyone and as a educator in front of the classroom if you are calm and you are um, you feel kind of grounded in your work you don't need language to convey that to your students they they can feel feel that through you know your actions towards them it's it, it's unspoken right and so I think you know relationships are that is the foundational part. And then you can layer in all those other things that you need to think about. And I think, you know, Kim spoke about the relations part, which I agree is really crucial. Thank you, thank you. So I'm also struck by, and I'm putting on my former administrator hat, I'm also thinking about just the power of stories as research. Um, when staff come to meetings and they just have stories to tell or you know we can look at people and almost read the data from their body language about um, the stressors that they may be feeling and how all of this really does count as evidence of how adults are feeling and, and how they're developing a better self or not to bring to the context so given that what would we really expect to see? What, what would we hope to see? Let's talk about in school first and then sometime, spend some time talking about virtually. What would we see in a context where attention really is being paid to adult SEL? Well, you know, you talk about stories and, mm -hmm. you know, King said it best that, that we're, we're all just stories mm -hmm. if you prefer Thomas King's work. Um, but we are, and we need to be able to, you know, have the humility as adults to kind of share our stories with one another and hold space for each other in a way that is, you know, really caring and compassionate and, you know, put all everything aside, you know, whatever negative feelings and, and just be with one another. And I, I found it very crucial in, you know, when we went into, um, uh, non, nobody was in schools and we were delivering online. I would meet uh, once a week with my team and I have a, quite a large team of about 38 people. And every Friday we would just have a check-in and we would just share. And people had an opportunity to talk about um, how they were feeling in you know, a non-judgmental way, just, just to be present and, and hold that space for each other and really be respectful and hear what people are experiencing. I don't think we acknowledge that space, that we need to have that space to be able to do it. It's easy enough just to say, let's just have a conversation, but really, and it's harder to do when you're uh, doing it virtually, right? We're so, we're as humans, we're, we love connection, right? And so when we have to do it virtually, it's a, a little bit more challenging, but I think it's really important um, to have that space in the virtual world. And it, it would be the similar thing for the students as well. It's just give them the space, the time that they need to share their stories and let just have that sharing, right? And all students so that they can acknowledge because, you know, many of us, and I think the adults more so because we like to think we're always in control of everything. And, you know, and we are in this unprecedented time where we don't know what the future brings for education and our students. And we're all concerned because we have to deliver it, but we want to be able to give something that's really kind of, um, you know, that's going to support the well-being of all students. So I think creating space and space that is, you know, as they say, brave space. Um, I've heard that term used before. Yeah, brave space. Be brave. Share what you need to share in a way and, and really kind of show your vulnerability 
um, as a person and allow your students to do that as well. And if you can be vulnerable together, I think that just strengthens the, the relationship. Thank you. Kim, with some of your uh, work with the schools in which you've been visiting, what are you seeing as evidence of a focus on adult SEL? And also, how does that translate into evidence that we're seeing in terms of enhanced relationships between adults and students? You know, so there, it's just been unprecedented times. I don't think anyone had ever foreseen this would happen. And we've really had to pivot and try and find new ways of being connected to one another. I love Chaz's um, description of how you connected with all the the others. And so what, what I'm hearing is so much of, um, because in British Columbia, we have had a focus on social and emotional learning. So as we um, went on lockdown, and it's actually as we're going back um, in, into school, it's actually September 10th, well, we'll see what happens, um, is there has been a heightened focus on well-being of all adults in the school. Um, so you hear it's not just the teachers. Um, I have to say the leaders, the administrators, they need to have their own uh, well-being plan and support the well-being of all the adults in the building and not just the teachers. Um, I just had one story that was so interesting. Um, some schools in uh, Surrey, which is a is another school district, the largest school district in British Columbia, they had um, they they had lockdown, but then they had some schools open for essential workers, uh, children. Um, and they talked about uh, one principal was telling me the story of how um, thinking about all of the adults in the building, the children, the custodian now had a very important role. The custodian, the children got to see the custodian so often because of the regular cleaning. And so the children began developing this very fun relationship with the custodian where they would, the young children would play little pranks to see if they'd move different things and the custodian kind of played along with it um, and kind of laughed and it created these new opportunities. So I think, you know, number one, with a focus on well-being, with a focus on compassion, realizing we're all stressed and people respond different ways to stress and, um, and really trying to say, how could we support it? And what I've really seen, um, you know, the one thing I want to say is that principals, and we know from research the important role of the school administrator. I don't mean to put that extra pressure on all of you school administrators out there, but you are the engine that drives the well-being of all in your school, and it's the, those things you do. So I've seen um, some administrators, which we know that leader is the one who sets the tone, who are now providing spaces for the teachers, the educators in the building to go during their um, short time like their their study their um planning time to actually go for walks out in nature which we know is so important so providing really rethinking and thinking about what can you do to support the adults um and we know how important that is um because really if you support all the adults and and i also want to say you know all the adults in the building but i you know and i think parents of course critical um here but i think we need to find some way to support the administrators well-being as well i don't i think you know, sometimes they're given, I think that the, their shoulders, everything lands on their shoulders and we need to find ways that they have their connections with one another and what is their own, um, what are the ways in the larger system that support their well-being? Because I think we, we have to continue to take a systemic approach. So it's not just a school as a unit, it's the larger system, both in the district and even the larger in the state and the, you know, and in the country. So, um, yeah, I'm 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 looking optimistic. You know, we know that that the pandemic could lead to some positive changes. Is a rethinking of what's important in school. And um, a great article in the Greater Good Science Center um, mentioned the two sort of top things: a way that lo the lockdown has led to could lead to positive change was increased focus on student social and emotional learning and increased attention to it, adult well-being. Yes, totally agree that this, this uh, COVID lockdown is helping us all rethink how we do our work. And as schools begin to move from virtual back to in-person, what can we take from the virtual context that worked that maybe we should be employing in our usual actual day-to-day? -day? And I love the idea of the nature walks. Um, I love the idea of having time set aside in staff meetings for folks to first take care of their compassion, their, their, their cares around personal well-being, 
before we get into the content, right? So putting the compassion needs before the content needs, which, which is a shift. I also wanted to mention that in our Castle School Guide, the whole focus area too is about adult SEL. And it talks about things such as relationship circles, the check-in, helping people move from fixed mindsets to growth mindsets, which, which so many people have had to do in the shift to how do I do my lessons virtually, right? That was definitely an unprecedented shift that people had to make. So as you continue to think about the lessons from COVID, what are some other opportunities that might be out there that maybe we hadn't thought of before or through our creativity we'll begin to think about and then launch? Any other ideas? I was just gonna mention one other thing that happened here is a different relationship between teachers and parents. Yes. Um, many, many of the teachers had to connect with parents in ways they never connected with them before. Um, in one district here, they made sure that every teacher or someone in the school um, individually contacted a parent either by phone or um, some other way to connect with them to find out how they're doing and how their child is doing. So, you know, often those relationships between um, the school and the home are somewhat, um, it's, it's a difficult bridge sometimes. <laughs> and, I, and I really want to learn what are the stories, what have we learned about that, that bridge that we can now have, have much smoother and connect in a, in a different way through a caring lens. Thank you. Um, Chaz, was there anything else that you wanted to share from the concept of holistic approaches and what that might mean in terms of um, other adult understandings that need to be deeply rooted? Well, I think, you know, in this time, in COVID time, it's more imperative now more than ever is to really kind of take time for yourself as an adult to take those quiet moments or to be where you need to be and you know find you know what we say is our our, our medicine um and for me you know, on the screen you see a picture there that's up in merit and i encourage you know my staff to find um you know a space or, or or a place where they can kind of center themselves. And for me, my medicine is um, silence and being out on the land and being able to, um, you know, pick medicines. And here is a picture from a few years ago up in Merritt when I went to pick sage, which you do in June and July. And um, you gather for the year ahead so that you can get that sage to, to people. And so again, you know, I get to enact, you know, the respect that it needs to be taken in order to do that, to understand that you're in relationship with the, the plants, you know, being relevant and, and, and being in that moment and really respecting my holistic, you know, need to, to connect to the land um, and then the reciprocity that, you know, I, whatever the land gives me, I have to give back and, and really kind of honor that relationship and and there's, you know, uh, protocols uh, that are required when you go out on the land and you go uh, pick your medicines. And then I have a responsibility to take to, to care for that medicine. And for me this year in COVID, yeah, since COVID time, I, I planted some tobacco in March. I was gifted a tobacco plant by, from a very good friend of mine. And I've been tending to that plant since March. And it was just a tiny little seed, just a little seed. And now it's 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 quite large. And so that has really kind of helped me get through um this time when i can't really necessarily get up to to those places where i want to pick my medicines but that being on my deck and and kind of nurturing that that's what i ask adults to to do as well is you know if you need to be on the water or by the water or on the land or outside that you find those moments to really kind of tend to yourself and into the silence so that you can kind of think about you know what um you know this pandemic how is it affecting you because we really need to we all realize that we're all being impacted 
greatly, right? And how we're impacted if we can attune to our emotions and our feelings and really kind of understand and and take those times where we can kind of just kind of calm ourselves and kind of really kind of acknowledge and honor where we are, then that is going to have a positive impact for our students. Thank you. That was a very powerful image of the Sage Trail and the, the whole idea of whole, having a holistic perspective really does invite every adult to think about, so what do I need? What do I need to tend to differently to not only keep myself lifted and to keep myself capable of, of doing this work, particularly now when the burden to um, be the bomb for so many others. I'm thinking about, you know, when adults are in schools where other staff members have maybe had the loss of family members and friends, and so too have students. Mm -hmm. How that's going to cause us all to have to go deep in our well of compassion mm -hmm. and to really be you know, our very best selves at being able to take care of not only who we are, but how others are as well. So any suggestions from either of you about what that's an invitation to do or what does that mean when you think about the, the new depth of being that we have to really dig into in order to be whole in a context that has been very broken by COVID? I can start, Chaz, or do you want to? Do you want to? Go ahead. I can jump. You know, just if you're talking about compassion, I think that really what a, a start would be practicing self-compassion, mm -hmm. of being able to have that ability to be compassionate for others. And, and like any other helping profession, you know, educators are at the top where they think about everyone else before they think about themselves. And they're hardest on themselves more than the, anyone else. And so that idea of starting with, messages of self-compassion of talking to yourself trying to imagine you know self-compassion is that idea of trying to imagine what your best best friend would be saying to you if you were having these things they would just say no you shouldn't be so hard on yourself care you know you're loved you're cared for you know so having that that sense of, of knowing that you tried your best and you just have to kind of go on i think another one is how important it is to have social support i think that teachers you know, we know that new teachers do really well when they have a mentorship program, when they have someone who's behind, you know, by their side, guiding them, supporting them. And so I think of creating buddies, creating teams that work together, that support each other. It's not about um, tearing each other down, but always saying, what can I do to lift up others today to help lift them up and help them feel the need to go on? I think um, we also really need to focus on, I mean, I, this, I guess I'll be a broken record. How important is it to start with the adults, like the adults' well-being, and think about as we go back to school, as we're doing this pandemic, what are some intentional things that can be done every day to help support the adults? Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's some programs that are really for adults. There's a program called CARE, or Cultivating Awareness and Resilience in Education, that Tish Jennings, Mark Greenberg, developed um, and Krista Turksma, there's that program, but there's also other programs out there that really show the benefits of focusing on um, uh, teacher well-being. Thank you. And it makes me think about how in so many schools, um, people tend to cluster by grade bands or I was a high school English teacher, so I knew all the English teachers maybe some of the other subject area staff I did not know as well. So just the need as we talk about our own circle of care, um, of really expanding beyond silos and really extending that, that um, arm of compassion to whoever needs it wherever they are. Because I think sometimes we relate most to people who are most like us, you know, in all of our identity factors, the people who are most like us are where we tend to go, but we're missing so many opportunities to connect, connect with others. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, you mentioned a program, any other programs or any other um, specific tactics as we're beginning to wind down? 
Well, I mean, you know, there's control a list of. Go, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Chess. I was just going to uh, respond. Oh, I was just going to talking about, um, you know, compassion and, and social support. You know how I see it as an indigenous, you know, um, you know, and the hair of Métis women is, I, you know, I really kind of there's a concept in Cree about, and I've used it to guide my uh, leadership and my relationships is Mia Wachotuan, which means good relations and Wakotun, which is kinship relations. And in our schools, we often, you know, we do get siloed as educators in our classrooms. We need to, you know, blow the walls down and, and, and begin to think about our schools as communities. And, you know, as an indigenous woman, Nihio Métis woman, you know, kinship relationships are really important. Um, and having those relationships and, and understanding that you come from a collective community where we're all kind of, if we were to think in a way and adopt an indigenous understanding that we're all related, um, uh, I think our compassion and empathy for one another could, could be broadened. And to build those relationships, those really strong, grade those relationships, weave them, beyond our classrooms, throughout the whole school system. I know educators, you know, and administrators, you know, they, they create that culture of, of community, but we need to find uh, more time to be able to do that in a way that is really authentic. So it's how you see it, and, that, and that's how I see it, you know, definitely our relationships um, are, are integral to our our well-being and having really strong relationships, um, like I said earlier, are foundational. Yeah, just that shift in thinking, you said the indigenous way of thinking of community as being a collective, which is so different from an individualistic um, perspective. And to me, it's going back to African frameworks as well about what's community and whose voice matters. I'm thinking about the griot, the storyteller, and the respect and all of that. So it really does speak volumes in terms of the equity lens as well. Because when you come from a communal perspective, you cast your net much broader in terms of who you're inviting in, mm -hmm. you know, who you're listening to, whose voice matters, who has the potential to be the comforting one, even though they might not be in a hierarchy in the traditional institutional sense. So thank you for helping us think differently about what is community and how are we being much more collective in our understanding of what community is. Kim, you were going to, you were about to say something? Yeah, just a couple of things. So first of all, I think that is such an important point about this equity lens and looking at that and how focusing on the adult well-being is actually going to help them help them have the capacity and others to create an equitable learning environment where everyone is included and everyone's voice counts you know because when you are stressed just so you know when you're stressed your brain is on self-centeredness you're just surviving so you you have kind of blinders on you just see what's right in front of you and it's all focused on yourself when you're able to re reduce your stress you're able to lift up and have empathy and compassion for others and see everyone else's suffering and pain and what you can do about it so that idea of helping you know reduce educators stress and we and, and there are a number of programs that have evidence-based i mentioned the care for uh teachers program there's another one called smart in education stress management and resiliency training um now um the committee for children is just released an adult sel uh, modules that that you can go on and and see as well as panorama education and then of course i have to mention the importance of going to castle to see the school guide and see the um the new release of Re reunite renew and thrive um sel roadmap for reopening schools which really says uh you know the second point the recommendation is to begin by really creating these opportunities where adults can connect with one another. Um, that is first and foremost, this idea of how do we help adults reconnect and heal and, and, and do that. And then the other thing, you know, we talk about stress and I'm kind of all negative, you know, everybody's all stressed, but, you know, we have to also think about, you know, there's some positive 
things that happened during the pandemic. Um, I, I'll speak for myself. I know um, being at home, not traveling as much, being with my family, having dinner every night with my husband and my two boys. Um, I guess they're adult men. I still call them my boys. But, um, you know, and I think the assumption can't be um, that everyone, I, I know we want to sort of see this as unprecedented times, but, you know, students and either adults might come in being, you know, saying this helped me reset and I'm coming in with a positive framework. So I think um, I was just thinking there was a study done just in Israel of kids during the pandemic of what uh, kids in elementary school. And it was so fascinating when you uh, they asked what they what happened during the pandemic. They said, well, they kind of liked it. They got to sleep later. <laughs> they got to connect dinner with their families more often. And, you know, and this is a certain group of kids. So I know this isn't true among all kids, but, you know, there was kids who felt that being at home. They um, also met, got to connect with their teachers in a different way that was more fulfilling and rewarding than they'd ever had before. And their only complaint was they fought more with their siblings, um, <laughs> which I think some people could relate to. Um, right. but, uh, you know, but I think that, um, you know, there, I guess my point really is being that there are ways to do this intentionally. And again, I want to keep on saying it has to be explicit and intentional ways to promote this. It's not just going to happen out of thin air. Thank you. And in terms of being explicit and intentional, this has been such a rich discussion with with a new way of thinking about adult SEL, but we want to make sure that our viewers have a chance to really see the key takeaways. So I'm going to ask that the slides go up and both I think Kim and Chaz, you're both going to talk about these takeaways. So Chaz, here you are. So this work is uh, Berna Kirkness and Ray Barnhart's work um, coming out of the 90s, but um, still very, very uh, integral for many Indigenous peoples, and this grounds our research, um, our, our understanding of, you know, um, our collective uh, as Indigenous peoples. Um, and I've used it as, you know, a framework for educators, a lens to look through when we think about uh, Indigenous um, holistic well-being. You know, we talk about the, you know, the spiritual, the emotional, uh, the physical, and the intellectual. And as holism you know we all as indigenous peoples and i'll just speak for myself um try to stay in balance we know that we can't always be in balance so at times where we're feeling there's a lack of, in some areas we really have to slow down and and say what areas is lacking right now what do i need and i think that's what adults really need to think about too in regards to social emotional uh learning or just a social emotional it's it, learning is like people are social and emotional all the time so the learning context for it just seems i think people just need to be more aware that you are social emotional beings and it's in relationship um which we don't have on the slide there but all these things having respect for yourself to to know uh what you need and to be kind of really honest with yourself that self-awareness that you know kim talked about earlier um, the relevance that you know your your emotions matter too right now as adults and and we need to take care of ourselves and and be in a good place so that our students can be in a good place because um, we owe them that reciprocity uh, to give back and we can't give back unless we're kind of feeling good about ourselves so we need to do things that help us with that social emotional um, well-being part and then you know we do have a responsibility. Um, as educators, as parents, as adults, as whatever, you know, um, role you're in, we have a responsibility uh, for the young people because, you know, like we keep saying, this is unprecedented times, but I think it has been a time of great innovation and I've seen some amazing things take place within my own department and a lot of uh, innovative online opportunities for students to do things differently in a different way and to really kind of be, I think, what has really opened my eyes is the creativity that you know this op this whole pandemic has provided has allowed people to be creative students and educators so i'll leave it with that and uh, you, you about your four r's and apply it to yourself and when you think about how do i do how do i go about ensuring that i'm social and emotionally feeling good about myself thank you so much and kim your takeaways 
Oh, great. I'm going to have to put on my glasses to uh, read them. The screen is kind of small. But I, and I just have to say how um, honored I am to really be here with Herring Chaz's perspective in all of this in this Indigenous way, because so much of what I, when I learn more and more is in, the Indigenous um, tradition really had social and emotional learning from the very start. We're just catching up in some ways because so much is embedded in that culture and so much is part of a way of being that they have. And we're just, you know, now figuring it out as well. So, you know, I wanna, again, did I say intentional and explicit yet? Um, I hope I say that enough times. So it has to be intentional and explicit to adult SEL central. It's central for creating these supportive, equitable learning environments to support the well-being of all students. Um, we should know that educators or adult SELs inextricably linked to students or children's uh, SEL and well-being. These are not two separate things. They are so linked, as I talked with the stress contagion study, but in positive ways too. Happiness is contagious and well-being and kids, you know, Chaz, you made that such a point. Kids see, they are so, they pay attention so much to every move, every smile, every, you know, sigh, everything, you know, and they're picking it all up. Um, we know that these skills are malleable, that you can teach them, you can promote them. It's not like you come into your life and you're just the way, one way. We know through research on neuroplasticity that you are malleable, malleable and you can be promoted, you know, so let's remain positive. Um, and then we know that, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to end really saying that really, if we want a wide scale uh, social and emotional learning across the nation, across the country, across the world, um, we really have to embed it within teacher preparation, that it becomes foundational to the way um, educators see education. And part of that teacher preparation should not only be about promoting students SEL, it should be and providing them with opportunities to develop their own social and emotional competence and well-being. Thank you, Kim and Chaz. This has been powerful. So many good pieces of information for us to think about as we plan, um, as we begin a new school year where relationships will matter more than ever. So thank you both for sharing such rich perspectives.